Welcome to the SafeCode eLearning course, Windows Access Controls. After you complete this training, you'll be able to define common window access control terms and concepts, select an appropriate service account for your application, discuss the benefits of using known folder IDs over hard-coded folder locations, know the appropriate folders for installing applications, storing application data, managing user-specific information, and writing temporary files. Identify tools available to test permissions on objects and use access control entries in access control lists in a consistent and secure manner. This course is designed as an introduction to basic concepts in Windows access controls. We will discuss the reason for using Windows access controls, the characteristics of security principles and how access controls affect them, types of access controls, terms and concepts, as well as aspects of mandatory and discretionary access control in the Windows operating system. We'll discuss testing strategies to validate that proper access controls are in place and best practices for making sure an application's use of access controls is secure. First, a little background on access control issues. It is important to pay attention to access control vulnerabilities because, when exploited, the damage can be very expensive to resolve. Fortunately, these types of vulnerabilities are easy to find with available tools, and the fix is typically as simple as changing the access control and retesting to verify nothing is broken. This training will help equip you with the skills to build proper access controls into your products and recognize and fix common access control weaknesses. Here are some terms to become familiar with. Securable object. A securable object is an object that can have security information associated with it through the use of a security descriptor. Examples are files, registry keys, named pipes, mail slots, mutexes, and semaphores. Security descriptor. A security descriptor contains security information for a securable object. DACL, or the Discretionary Access Control List, is a list of entries that grant or deny certain rights. SACL, or the System Access Control List, is a list that gives an administrator the ability to log attempted access to a secured object. ACE, or an Access Control Entry, is a specific permission granted to a security object in its discretionary access control list. And SID, or the Security Identifier, is a unique identifier associated with a user, user group, or other security cohort. At the core, access controls simply define who gets access to the resource. Access controls are very flexible. The most familiar use of access controls is granting access to files or system resources to a specific user or user group, such as the group Authenticated Users or the group Remote Desktop Users. A security principle is any entity that can be authenticated by the system. This includes user accounts, computer accounts, or security groups of these accounts. Any security principal can have associated access controls. Every security principal is assigned a security identifier, or SID, when created. Service accounts and the machine principal are similar to user accounts from the operating system's perspective. There are a few other types, like logon sessions, which we will not discuss here since they are so rarely used. If you're building a Windows Server or COM Server, one of the most important security choices you need to make at design time is selecting which service account to use. The basic rule is to apply least privilege, that is, use the service account with the most restricted privileges that will still accomplish your goals. Never use the local system. It is the root account of a Windows system. It grants complete access to the operating system with full privileges. The local system account can be used maliciously to change account privileges and even lock out the system administrator. It is only appropriate to use this account for Windows installation, registry editing, etc., never for application permissions. If you really can't get around a need for the local system account, then make authorization constants instead. Most of the time, the appropriate account will be the local service account, which is a built-in account with no privileges. Do not confuse this with the local system account. Network service accounts are equivalent to local service accounts, but use the machine principle for authentication. A problem with using these built-in accounts, however, is that they often wind up granting access to too many things. 
For example, because the local service account has no inherent privileges, every service that runs as local service has to grant access to files and registry keys on as-needed basis. The frequency of this ad hoc access makes local service an attractive account to target for compromise. Instead of granting access to local service, assign your service a Service-Specific Security Identifier, or SID, and grant access to the Service-Specific SID instead of local service. That way, only your designated Windows service and no other Windows service will have access to your product's data. It is worth mentioning that using services this way means the application developer needs to think through password policies in advance. Another useful account is the Network Service Account. Use this if your service communicates with other servers in the same Active Directory domain. That way, your service can authenticate to another system, such as an SQL server database, as the machine principal, instead of using username and password credentials. This will save you development time, and it will save your customers administration time, because there will be one fewer set of credentials to manage. CSIDL, or Constant Special Item ID List, in Windows XP and older operating systems. These were values that provided a unique system-independent way to identify special folders used frequently by applications. Using the CSIDL solved the problem of folders that may not have the same name or location on any given system. For example, the system folder may have been C colon backslash Windows, pronounced C Windows, on one system, and C colon backslash WinNT on another system. As of the release of Windows Vista, the use of CSIDL values has been replaced by known folder ID values. Windows Vista introduced new storage scenarios and a new user profile namespace. To address these factors, the old method of referring to standard folders by CSIDL value was replaced. Now, application-specific folders are indexed by a globally unique identifier, or GUID value, that serves as the known folder ID. Using a known folder ID provides several advantages. First, known folder IDs are extensible. A developer can define folders, assign known folder IDs, and register them with the system. CSI DL values could not be extended. Second, known folder IDs on a system can be enumerated. There was no API to provide this functionality for CSI DL values. Also, a developer can add custom properties to a known folder to explain its purpose and intended use. Furthermore, known folders can be redirected to new locations, including network locations. Under the CSI DL system, only the My Documents folder could be redirected. Finally, known folders can have custom handlers for use during creation or deletion. Per user, roaming app data. This is application data that is specific to individual users. Use this to maintain and refer to settings for individual users. Per machine, non-user specific and non-roaming app data. CSIDL common app data. This is application data that is user independent. Examples might include a spell check dictionary, clip art, or log files, etc. Data is read only for everyone except the administrator. In the event an application needs to write to a subfolder of CSIDL common app data, then the application or its installer must explicitly modify permissions to allow it during setup. Always install applications in system folders such as program files or applications. Use application data folders to store application data. Store global settings in a location that only privileged users can modify. Save temporary files, user-generated data, and user application settings in per-user folders. Do not store anything in the system temporary folder if possible. During installation, your application must not store more than a total of 128K across HKCU and HKLM. For the registry, do not store any user configurable settings in the HKey local machine. Instead, store configurable settings in HKey current user. Since the Access Control List, or ACL, inherited from Windows does not grant write access to users, there's probably a good reason why your app shouldn't either. Do not grant users write access to HKLM keys. 
it is appropriate to store small amounts of data, such as less than 64K, in the HKCU registry. It is also appropriate to store per-user policy settings or security preferences there. It's difficult to create temporary files securely. We recommend using per-user temporary directories instead of system temporary directories because this can mitigate race issues. A race condition may allow attackers to compromise the system while an application creates temporary files. Even if the application checks for a file's existence before creation, there is a brief gap of time during which an attacker can exploit to create a file. It is possible to create an application that is not vulnerable to this attack, but it is easier to just avoid this workflow. For more on this topic, refer to the information provided at the link shown on the slide. If your application must use system temporary directories, we recommend using a standard library function, such as mkstemp or tempfile-s. These functions are atomic, so an attacker cannot create a file before your application completes its task. So far, we've only had to worry about permissions for a single level in the directory hierarchy. But keep in mind, a directory's ancestors can influence its permissions as well. In Windows, subdirectories and files inherit permissions from their parent folder by default. Although permissions are inherited, access checks do not traverse the entire directory hierarchy. Windows can bypass the parent permissions through bypass traverse checking. Imagine that you want to access the folder bar, which resides in the directory foo. You can access bar if the ACL for bar gives you access. This is true even if the ACL for foo does not grant you access. Bypass traverse checking. This user right determines which users can traverse directory trees even though the user may not have permissions on the traverse directory. This privilege does not allow the user to list the contents of a directory, only to traverse directories. This user right is defined in the Default Domain Controller Group Policy Object, or GPO, and in the Local Security Policy of Workstations and Servers. Default, on Workstations and Servers. Administrators, Backup Operators, Power Users, Users, Everyone, on Domain Controllers, Administrators, Authenticated Users. Directories have a different set of options compared to files. The most notable difference is the inheritance option. This option controls how permissions apply to descendants of the current directory. Inheritance is denoted by a two-character sequence and may be one of the following. CI, meaning directory descendants will inherit permissions. OI, meaning file descendants will inherit permissions. IO, these permissions do not apply to the current object. Or NP, which means descendants will not inherit any permissions. You may also see special access flags. These controls are more granular compared to the permissions discussed in the previous slide. Read access, write access, change, and full access. All are actually a combination of these special permissions. Generic underscore read and generic underscore execute are two you may see often. Vista added additional controls known as integrity levels. Now, integrity levels are checked before file permissions are checked. Objects cannot access other objects that have higher integrity levels. Internet Explorer 7 protected mode on Vista runs as a low integrity process. This means it can only access certain low integrity folders on the file system. Tools available to test for permissions on objects include Access Check, Process Explorer, Attack Surface Analyzer, and OBJSC, win OBJ. This table shows appropriate circumstances to use each. For example, any tool can be used to test permissions on registry keys. On the other hand, only the Process Explorer is appropriate for testing permissions on threads. There is a fast way to manually check an ACL. Select the object by right-clicking its file name, registry key, etc. Then click Properties. When the Properties window opens up, Click the Security tab to view the DACL. Then click the Advanced button to view the specific access control entries and the calculated permissions. You can also take an automated approach to checking ACLs. You can use the Access Check tool available for download from the MSDN, that is the Microsoft Developers Network. You can point it to a folder and specify a user to find out what objects the user has access to. 
For example, look under C colon backslash program files for files that regular users are able to access. Users shouldn't have write access in this folder. Look for access granted to everyone. It is highly unlikely that everyone is the appropriate group because this includes anonymous users and guests. It is safer to grant access to authenticated users instead because this excludes anonymous users and guests. Always restrict access to the smallest group possible. If you see any of the groups listed, local, network, batch, etc., review whether that is really the appropriate group to use to grant access. It's likely that authenticated users is a better choice. Even if all the objects inside a container have the correct access control placed on them, you still need to check the container object itself to see if it gives too much access. Examples of container objects include directories, Directories can contain child directories and files, registry keys, which can contain other registry keys or data, and processes. Processes can launch threads. Although it is possible to restrict the permissions on child objects, the parent objects could have ACEs that allow too much access. For example, if a parent object allows tampering, additional child objects could be created or permissions could be modified. If your application isn't inheriting appropriate permissions from the parent container, you're probably using the wrong container. Instead, use the operating system's inherited ACLs. Consider using one of these containers. C colon backslash program files, H key current user, or the user's application data folder. Make sure your application permits only administrators to alter the configuration file and store user-specific dot in e files to an appropriate per user registry key or folder. If you're considering using a deny ACE in your application to restrict access, that is probably the wrong way to go. There are only a few known valid use causes for using deny ACEs in low-level systems programming. The problem with using deny ACEs is that they may not take precedence, depending on their order and inheritance, and they make effective permissions difficult to calculate. Overall, it is better to use authenticated users instead. The order of ACEs in the ACL is significant. Correct interpretation depends on both the order of ACEs in the ACL and whether they were inherited. Since this can quickly get very complicated, it's recommended to just inherit the operating system ACLs. Just make sure you always check them for correctness. This slide illustrates why ACE sequence matters. The system examines each ACE in sequence until one of the following takes place. An ACE is found that explicitly denies access, in which case access is denied. An ACE is found that explicitly grants access, in which case access is granted. All ACEs have been examined without a match being found. In this case, access is denied by default. As you see here in thread A, the system checks ACE1. Because it finds Andrew in an ACE that denies access, access is denied and no further checking takes place. For thread B, the system checks ACE1. No match is found, so it checks ACE2. Because it finds a match to group A in an ACE that grants access, access is granted and no further checking takes place. So you can see if the order of ACE1 and ACE2 was reversed, both thread A and thread B would have been granted access. This illustrates why establishing the correct ACE sequence is so important. This example applies only to application objects. Access to system objects is governed by the operating system according to a preferred order of ACEs in a DACL. The final problem we will discuss is the use of null DACLs. You can create a security descriptor with a null DACL argument in order to use the operating system's default DACL. Before Windows XP, these DACLs were very weak and a source of security vulnerabilities. Since Windows Vista and later, the defaults have been tightened up somewhat, but there are still holes. Do not set null DACLs unless you have reviewed the created DACL to ensure that it is secure. This concludes this overview of Windows Access Controls. For further information, refer to the resources available at the links listed on this slide.